Welcome to Faith, Fantasy, and Fairy Tales, a conversation between two Christian nerds about D&D, sci-fi, and any other nerdy stuff we can think of. I'm Seth. I'm Monty. Let's get nerdy together. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about one of the most important and influential characters in D&D. Monty, what's his name? The legendary spellcaster known as Morden Kanan. Morden Kanan, that's right. Morden Kanan is uh, one of those names when you have been playing D&D for any amount of time, you almost instantly know the name, though you don't know any you might not know any lore about him. The name is ubiquitous, you yep, might say, definitely. in D&D. You find it in Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes. I say Morden Kanan, a lot of people say Morden Kanan. Um, it's actually okay to pronounce it both ways, according to the lore that we've found. Right, Monty? That's correct. Kynan or Kanan, it don't matter. <laughs> so anyways, you can find him in Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes. I even use them interchangeably. Yep. <laughs> the newest one is uh, Morden Kynan's... What's it called? I just I just bought it, too. Um, Morden Kynan... Is it a guide to everything? Kind of like Xanathar's it's, or Tasha's? Uh, or... I, will bring I guess right I don't up. know this one. Very brand new. Came out within the last couple of months. And I believe it's like kind of D&D 5.5. Is it the Guard to the so Sword Coast? Or a Guide no. to the Sword Coast? <laughs> no, it is not. I oh, will okay. tell you post-haste because I've got it right here next to me. Let me just pull it up. Anyways, Morden Kanan's uh, Tomb of Foes. He, he has a lot of spells named after him. We'll probably get into those in a little bit. He is kind of that. Oh, that's what it is. Morden Kanan presents Monsters of the Multiverse, which Monsters is Monsters like of the I Multiverse. Said, oh, right, right, right. Which is like I said, uh, it's a newer um, supplement to Fifth Edition, and it's almost a little bit like five point five edition. And what makes you say that? Well, because it changes a little bit of the uh, like uh, playable races to a certain extent. So you've got oh, I um, see. For instance, my favorite race of all time to play other than the drow uh, so I guess my second favorite <laughs> is an Aarakocra right? Love Aarakocras and from Xanathar's Guide to Everything mm -hmm. to Morden Kanan Presents uh, Monsters of the Multiverse there's a massive change in the way they are played so just something to think about if you're, if you're looking at those kind of things but anyways back to Morden Kanan Monty, what do you know about Morden Cannon, and why is it that we chose Morden Cannon specifically for this episode? Well, we're on to episode three now, um, if we include uh, the Baldur's Gate and Beholder's Edition, so we're on to our character, and we wanted to do a character that was both, you know, some, somebody who's prolific, right, in the uh, universe, one that's commonly used, uh, in different campaigns, whether it be a module or people bringing him in their own homebrews. And we wanted it to be a, a character that, again, if you're starting out in D&D, that you would want to familiar, right, familiarize yourself with just because <laughs> uh, this, this character has a lot of those, like you said, spells and influences um, and sort of far-reaching uh, tethers, I guess you could say, throughout all of the lore of D&D, &D. and so it's it would be an important sort of foundational subject, and um, I think coming from the creation of Gary Gygax, you know, is it, it takes you all the way back to the very beginning of D&D. &D. Right, right. So I you brought up Gary Gygax. I just want to kind of kind of hone in on that topic just for a second, because I honestly, I really, really like the fact that Morden Kanan like his origination, right? Gary Gygax, those of you in the know, you know, he's like the godfather of D&D. &D. He and Rob Kuntz, he primarily created it, and then Rob Kuntz and him kind of shared TSR, uh, built the world of Dungeons & Dragons. Um, he's the godfather, right? And Morton Kanan is actually a player character of Gary Gygax, which I thought was just astounding. Because I have all these different 
these different characters in my own mind, in my own games, in my own thoughts, that are like, oh, you know what? I would love to see this guy, you know, have his own storybook and have his own movie and all these things. Morton Kanan actually became that for Gary. Morton Kanan was developed, obviously, as a player character wizard um, for Gary. And it was during the very first iteration of D&D, and Rob and Gary, Rob Koontz and, and Gary Gygax, uh, thought that it would be actually kind of a cool idea, and this is in 1973, guys, to co-DM a game. So they're telling a story together. Which is crazy. <laughs> which is crazy. It blows you, the mind. If you've right? DM'd before, you know, usually yeah. that you, you, you have very direct control over things, and... Uh, do it. I, I can't imagine really doing it with a, a co DM, but I, I do know that there's a lot of this kind of stuff out there too, and I'm, I, I kind of feel like now it's one of those times I should try this. But you how did I it turn? It. You and I should do it one time. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> that would be fun. So how did that turn Anyways, out? It it turned out pretty good. Uh, Morden Kynan, Morden Kanan, Morden Kynan kind of uh, developed over the course of let's see, seventy three to eighty five, so or well, eighty four really. Uh, so over 11 years, he actually developed this character, got him up into – eventually, Morden Kanan technically, according to the lore that uh, I researched, is a level 27 wizard. That's pretty high for anybody out there. That's yep. basically – that's like god tier without actually being a deity. And Gary, Gary Gygax got him to that point basically and then – in 85, when, T- when uh, TSR and Gary Gygax kind of split ways, and there's a little bit of controversy there, uh, unfortunately, TSR actually maintained the rights to Morden Kanan, and Gary Gygax didn't have the uh, creative license over Morden Kanan anymore. So Morden Kanan became no longer a player character, but an NPC almost in the world of D&D, which I thought was kind of a, a cool backstory just about how he came into existence. And he actually started a group of, of wizards, basically. Well, he actually started a couple of groups. He started, the first one was called the Citadel of Eight, and then they were all killed. And then he decided, well, I'm going to start this other group of Aerithian wizards called the Circle of Eight. And so he kind of runs that group. So you just mentioned Aer- Aerithians. Uh, Seth, <laughs> what is Aerith? Can you describe Earth. that, it's, please? I want to. I want to say air because you're going <laughs> to say it one way, and I'm going to say it another way. Yeah. Uh, it's spelled Earth O E R T H. Yes. So pronounce it however you choose. There are three pronunciations, three official pronunciations out there, but uh, I'm going to go with Earth. Earth is basically this place in the gray space in the Greyhawk realm of D and D. So that you've got these different realms. You got Forgotten Realms, which Toral is the main body, the main planet, basically, that is in Forgotten Realms. And then you have another place called Kryn, which is where the Dragonlance books and games are all affiliated with. And then you have Earth, which is in the Greyhawk realm, right? So it's basically the name of the planet in Greyhawk. So Morden Kanan is from Earth, um, and... Like you said, the Circle of Eight with the Arthian with wizards. So, uh, I guess how would you describe Morden Kanan's right? So he's a human, but you know what are what are his traits? What's he first of all? What does he look like? Well, uh, originally Gary uh, kind of drew him as this like shaggy haired, gray beard and gray hair older gentleman. Now the ideal, I guess you could say, of Morden Kanan is this bald, very tall and slim, hawkish face. He's got a mustache, very like pin mustache and a little tiny goatee. He looks powerful. He almost exudes power just when you look at him. It's actually kind of cool when you when you look at like the uh, cover of Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes. Like he looks like he's running the joint. You know, he is uh, human, like you said. He also has this like uh, both of us were in the military. <laughs> um, we did different things in the military. When I was in Iraq, people would uh, develop what what uh, we would like to call the thousand yard stare, right? Because they saw something in combat or whatever else. Right. 
Morton Canaan definitely had that thousand yards there because he he's basically this guy that that just traveled the entirety of the multiverse. I mean, we're we're gonna get into a little bit more of that too here in a little bit, but he basically just he's like god level, except he's not a deity, right? He he can be defeated. And at one point was even driven mad during a visit to uh, Barovia with uh, Count von Strahd. So right. But let's back up a little bit because, uh, you know, I don't want to lose anything here. Where, where are we seeing right now? Like right now, any, any places that you've seen the name or heard the name or have any like pop culture references that, that you know, Morden Kanan is uh, in currently? Well, <clears throat> I don't know about pop culture references. Um, there is the tie that... Um, I had discovered, did not know this during my first viewing of the D&D movie, but after uh, researching for this, uh, I discovered that uh, Morden Kanan is the creator of the Helmet of Disjunction, which is sort of your MacGuffin um, item in the D&D movie. <laughs> and uh, what's what's also crazy is Zenik Yendar... I didn't know this either. I thought that he was just a made-up character for the movie. No, that is a that is a standard character. And Zenik yep. and Morden Kanan had a relationship where uh, Morden Kanan hated the Helmet of Disjunction. He was afraid it was going to start destroying his magical artifacts, and so he got rid of it. And Zenik was the one who helped him do that. <laughs> and yep. so, and it's really funny because the the cover art for Zenik or Zenk. It's identical to the character that ended up being in the movie. It's like they found the actor that like modeled for the painting. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild. So yeah, um, Zank Yendar is to correct that, but yeah, that that's uh, I guess the most most close uh, pop culture. Um, as far as references go, like you said already, I'd say the absolute most references that you get from Morden Kanan is spells. Um, oh, including yeah, sure. Morden Kanan's Disjunction, which is like the spell that would do the same thing that the Helmet of Disjunction does. Which but. which I thought was kind of funny because the people that, that wrote the movie, I, I think they did a really wonderful job doing Easter eggs. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to review the movie. This isn't a review of the movie because this is going to tie right into what we're talking about. But they used the Helm of Disjunction, right? Against what? What was the reason they went to, to find it? It was... Uh, Morden Kanan's, uh, oh gosh, it's it's a seal. spell. Morden Kanan's yeah. seal, yeah, it's the spell. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they basically took two things that Morden Kanan developed, yep, and used them against each other. Right. Essentially, <laughs> I thought that was really kind of a neat idea, and and it was one of those things. Was like when I was when I was actually watching it because I watched it again last night, actually. Oh yeah, and I was watching it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is super cool. Mm -hmm. Like. Only nerds at the level of nerdiness that I am yeah. <laughs> would even come anywhere close to understanding what's going on here. And that's awesome. I, I, all you nerds out there, this, this podcast is for you. I love you guys. That's why I say it. Mm. Um, let's kind of get into his comrades, the people okay. he surrounded himself sure. with. So, I mean, he got a lot of the wizards that you uh, would know from other spells in his group. So um, I guess you could reference... Uh, from the circle of eight alone, probably a uh, majority of the ones that you would know. So like Bigby, right? Bigsby's hand, uh, yep. or Bigby's hand. That's a famous spell. Everybody loves that. Oodaluke, um is another one. So yeah, these, these are people from I, the Council of Eight. Go ahead. Uh, you said Odaluk, uh, that sphere that uh, Safina uses against Edgen and Helga uh, in the movie? Sphere of Water? or uh, no, no, it's Odaluk's uh, Sphere of Invulnerability. Invulnerability. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where they go rolling he, away. Yes. Yeah, he locks, yep. she locks them in that, and then they go rolling away. So yep. those of you, again, if you guys watch the movie or have an opportunity to uh, uh, kind of expand your mind a little bit, these are these are actually references to Morden Kanan uh, in a roundabout way. Uh, like he said, Bigby's hand, and that's another uh, that was another spell that was used in Honor Among Thieves, and I thought very well. 
Mac, two big Maximilian's hands. Maximilian's Earth and Grasp was used. There was a lot of good ones in there, but um, there was so, there was a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. you can um, almost guarantee yeah. that any of these spells that were developed during like the era of Morden Kanan, he would have been a, related to these these spellcasters in right. some way because um, spell development is certainly like their that's like what they're known for. This entire group, um, Tensor right. is another one. I think it's Tensor's Mind Whip is the uh, spell. yep, and then and then uh, Rary's Telepathic Bond. Rary is one of his Council of Eight. There's a good one. Um, yeah. So, so a lot of these people that he surrounded himself with, essentially, he was kind of like the shadow leader of this group, the Circle of Eight, and he kind of and their basically their goal was balance in the universe, in the multiverse. Excuse me. Right. Uh, uh, if if you guys have the time and you want to go check it out, if you go on to D and D lore specifically, like onto D and D website and then their lore tab, you can read about. And they don't have a whole lot of lore on there. It's a, it's unfortunate you can't get much of it. A lot of what we're what we learned was from a lot more digging. I can tell you that. What essentially they said about Morden Kanan was he had come to the point where ultimate balance was the most important thing. So a balance between good and evil, right? right? Kind of that yin-yang thing. And so he was constantly going to Avernus, the first level of hell, and studying it and studying the blood war and stuff like that. Yep. But he also had a couple of other wizards on his level that he regularly hung out with, essentially. He was... He was actually very good friends with uh, Elminster. Yep. Elminster is actually a creation of Ed Greenwood. So there you go. Elminster Omar. And you guys might know that name if you've watched the movie out there. Um, Elminster Omar is a – he's he's from Toril, the Forgotten Realms. And he is like an exceptionally powerful wizard just like Morden Kanan. Right. Um, and then another one from – the world of the Dragonlance, Kryn. Uh, his name was Dalamar. Both of those, and actually I want to say all three of those names, if you ever read like an Elminster book, you might hear something about Morden Kanan or Dalamar. Uh, when I read, I read a couple of the Dragonlance books uh, a few years ago, and Dalamar was one of the absolute main characters. And there's kind of a funny thing between Dalamar and Morden Kanan, they're essentially like very close in personality. Always kind of look like they're angry, kind of uh, don't really care about people, care about magic. Like that's right. what they're all about. Elminster kind of he's the gentler soul. That a little bit. He was yeah. He, he definitely liked people more. Yeah, he's um, he's got that like grandfather type personality. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he does, yeah. he has the looks to match it as well. Well, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, Elmester, he's, they're great. And what was cool about specifically those three is they came up, Ed Greenwood, we've talked about him in the past. We talked about him uh, in our last episode Yep. Uh, when it came to Beholders. Ed Greenwood actually started writing a article, or not re- really an article, a column for the the Dragon magazine. Do you know right. the, the did you know about the Dragon Magazine? I was aware of it, yes. Okay. I've never well, had he wrote, one, so because it's wrote been column, discontinued for a, a long time. He, he wrote a column and started it in 91, and it, uh, the, the column ended in 2007. Um, but the column was all about essentially those three wizards meeting at Ed Greenwood's house and talking about the different spells that they had come up with throughout the multiverse yeah which i thought was really cool and that kind of gets us into our our next thing uh specifically on uh morden kanan's abilities he was a prolific you said it before a prolific spell designer and creator right not to say that every single one of his spells is one that i would take on my path to my level 20 wizard but (laughs) <laughs> um, I I would say that uh, the variety of things made by Morden Kanan is um, it's long and deep. He's he's an ocean of uh, of knowledge when it comes to the spells. I already talked about Morden Kanan's disjunction, but two of them that I I discovered while researching this uh, really stood out to me. One is 
Mordenkainen's Force Missiles, which is identical but more powerful than a magic missile. It has a concussive blast effect, which is pretty wow. interesting uh, that you can um, do a dexterity save from. Uh, it has the same vulnerability that any spellcaster can throw shield up as a reaction, and it will be instantly consumed by those. And then Morton Kanan's Involuntary Wizardry. This spell is hilarious. <laughs> so essentially, you so he's got a lot of a lot of these sort of, sort of very funny spells. Morton Kanan does like uh, lucubration or yeah, lucubration. Lucubration oh, yeah. is lucubration. He, yeah, he yeah. you immediately remember a spell that you have cast before, but only within the last twenty four hours. That's what it does. You you can oh. remember and then cast that spell. So I don't know what specific thing happened to Morden Kanan where he had forgotten a spell 24 hours later I do actually I do <laughs> Oh really? Uh, yeah, I actually have I have some insight on that. Uh so when I was doing my research um Morden Kanan I told you before that he went to Barovia, Barovia. and fought yep. fought uh, von Strahd, right? Yep. Well, when he fought Strahd, he actually was defeated yep. by Strahd. And it made him go mad. Essentially, well, he lost his his book, his staff. He lost his and his book, memory. And, yep, and his memory yep. exactly. And so, so the bell that he created, involuntary wizardry, was to bring about that remembrance. Oh, you're thinking of lucubration. Luke, involuntary oh, wizardry is a different one. I'll have to get on I that apologize. one because that yeah, one's yeah, really yeah. funny. Lucubration. Um, he it, it was to bring about that memory of the spell that he had, you know, used 24 hours earlier because he was having a hard time and actually. Um, one of the people that helped him out of his madness, Monty, do you know who it was? Uh, it was Elminster. It was Elminster, yep. exactly. And that, that was, was after he had escaped him. Barovia, though, and made it right. back to... Right. Um, it, honestly, it, it's, it's kind of cool, because it's your players, if you ever play a Curse of Strahd campaign, if you play that, your players end up saving Morden Kanan if you don't kill him. My party yep. did when we went through our campaign, <laughs> killed him, and I we didn't get any reward for it besides I think his cloak, which is like is a cloak of like misty step or something stupid. Um, which is funny because he's a level twenty seven wizard and well, he's got he, kind he, of lame. He cast a uh, time stop on us, right? Sure, <laughs> but that's all he did. He didn't know what we were doing, so like our wizard like dispelled it uh, with a counter spell, and then we just like obliterated him. Like he's he's not that difficult anyway that was that was the <laughs> not uh, in his mad yes that was the <laughs> he can't remember himself lived in the woods was eating bugs version of morden canaan right, so it does right. not get out of hand but he anyway if you if you choose to save him or at least kill strahd and then he gets his memory or his his saneness back a little bit yeah. he ends up going to water deep and meeting with elminster and then they right th that all happens um so involuntary wizardry okay <laughs> this is this is hilarious. You can cast this on any target that can cast spells. Okay? I, I think there's a limited range in there. Um, sure. I think it's any ca uh, uh, your target that you can see. Um, so that's probably the limitation. But yeah. essentially what happens is they are now forced to cast any random spell. And, and that includes all the way up to, like, Wish. Or, really? Or meteor storm? Yes. Any random spell. Any random spell, not a spell that then that they know and is in their book, or even can cast, even if they're incapable of casting it. Normally, they are forced to cast it. Now, the repercussions of that is, if the spell cannot act as normal because of the environment, then the sum of whatever possible damage, or um, assumed damage from the result of something like that, the DM would have to then figure out that spell yeah. does damage to the target, being wow. the spellcaster, right? So it could wow. be like if you, let's say, you know, you're, I don't know, in the Underdark and you cast like this involuntary wizardry and they have to do like, I don't know, Meteor Storm or something and that's you know, yeah. not outside then just all of that damage just goes to the target, right? <laughs> they just, they'd be dead. <laughs> <D> done. <laughs> but the interesting thing about involuntary wizardry is 
you're forcing them to cast the spell, but you're also not you're not directing them, and they don't get to choose targets for their own spells either. So they're just going to just cast something, right? Yeah. Um, so I, as far as like the uh, uh, effectiveness of this spell, I'm not sure what Morden Kanan was really thinking, but maybe it's <laughs> to just create confusion. <laughs> Chaos. Yeah, because chaos. because suddenly Balance this wizard chaos. would just shoot a uh, I don't know like a thunderbolt <laughs> yeah. or something right? or a lightning bolt, <laughs> and he just it just goes off in some random direction or or whatever, and uh, you know uh, ho- hopefully was... something happens like maybe you roll yeah. like a like a, a d10 or whatever to figure out which direction they shoot it in, you know, right. um, and if yeah. it's if it's uh, if it's like nine, they shoot themselves or something. You know, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so <clears throat> I do think that there's there's a lot of good ways to play that. But yeah, it's just a really fun one. I didn't know about this spell until just now, and th- right. on, upon discovery, I was I was pretty happy with the m- the potential hilarious things that could happen. It is funny. Uh, you know, th- I was looking at I was looking at one of the spells that he created was uh, Morden Kanan's protection from avians. Mm, right, and I mean. I understand that there are b- birds out there that could be dangerous, like a rock, like a or, rock you know, yeah. aracocras that are warriors or whatever else. But all that brings to mind is like the movie Birds, <laughs> you know, the Alfred Hitchcock movie. Yeah, and like the <laughs> the birds are attacking everybody. Yep. <laughs> And he was just like, "Gosh, I can't, I can't deal with these birds anymore." Yep. <laughs> and so he just started. He came up with a spell that was to protect himself with birds. Yeah, yeah. That or the the pigeons <laughs> like would you know poop on his uh, carriage wherever he parked it or yeah. something, <laughs> or or on his or on his tower because he also tower. has protection yes. from insects and protection from uh, like uh, what is it reptiles and amphibians, yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah. it's like he obviously doesn't like pests. Yeah, yeah, he's exactly. just been coming up with spell casting I, 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 ways yeah. of like pest control. Where, where's, where's his uh, Morden Kanan's protection from rodents? Right, you know? <laughs> it's probably out there. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe hasn't been yeah. officially placed in the in the campaign lore yet. Right. Anyway. Anyways, um, so Morden Kanan, you know, obviously we kind of discussed his his abilities a little bit and and his his appearance, uh, Monty. Where where would you, where would you find Morden Cannon if you were playing a, like a campaign? What where would he be? Well, I guess that really depends on the context of the campaign. Sure. Now, generally, let's say your party went out looking for Morden Cannon, right? Well, right. If you were receiving that information from your party, let's say your party knows that, right? And you're the DM, um, then you would probably direct them towards Waterdeep, right? Or okay. or you would put Mordenkainen's Tower of Urn, which is what he uses to travel the multiverse, somewhere within the realm that they're in, right? Somewhere maybe right. even close by, um, or maybe the party stumbles upon that naturally. Mordenkainen likes to go to Waterdeep to party with Elminster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, which is, that's pretty cool. I mean, who wouldn't want to party with a wizard, right? So but, the the most recent the most recent book that I read was a Ed Greenwood book on about basically Elminster and a couple of other people. Okay. Um, it was called, De- it was called death masks. And, um, it was, it was like the, the open Lord of Waterdeep was like the main character. Okay. Um, Laurel still Silverhand. And then the other, the, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called. The, the other, the other Lords of Waterdeep, the, they're not open Lords. They're not open. I guess <laughs> the closed the lords. Clo- the closed lords. Yeah, I, don't, I can't remember what they call them. But basically, the, the shadow they, lords. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, they they're the masked lords. I think that's. Oh, what that okay. Is, yeah, that makes sense. Anyways, so Elminster is hanging out, helping out uh, Laurel Silverhand, and there's like a full chapter where Morden Kanan just shows up for a party. <laughs> yep. And it was like random, like what the heck oh, are you yeah. doing in this freaking book, dude? That's great. <laughs> it was really funny. I was like, what the heck? I didn't expect Morden Kanan to show up in oh, this book. Man. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was good. It was a really good book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like we we talked about a little bit the uh, the fact that um, Morden Kanan, Dalimar, and Elminster. Uh, Elminster were friends. What yeah. I thought was kind of kind of a cool thing, and we 
kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, Ed Greenwood would actually, in his wizard column that I spoke about earlier, the he called it the Wizards 3. Mm-hmm. And he actually essentially made it like, you, you even can find pictures that he drew of Dalimar, Elminster, and Mordenkainen all sitting around a fire, much like we're doing right now, mm-hmm. sitting in front of the fire in our high back chairs smoking pipes. Mm-hmm. They would sit around and they would just discuss the magic of the multiverse. And Morden Kanan would write himself into every single call, or not Morden Kanan, excuse me, Ed, Ed Greenwood. Greenwood. He would write himself into every single column as like a fly on the wall character, like he'd be hiding in a suit of armor. And when they were there, Elminster, Morden Kanan, and Dalimar. Uh, referred to him as Ed of the Greenwood. So he, he actually immersed himself into Dungeons and Dragons lore. I know we're not... Uh, Ed Greenwood's not the topic of this particular uh, podcast, but I just thought that was, like... That's something I would do. Yes. You know? yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely part of this, for sure. I'm going to be a fly on the wall character. Honestly, like- with a last name like Greenwood, <laughs> like... It's it yeah, was yeah. it was bound to happen, right? Yeah, it was yeah, he indefinite. Was, he was <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Obviously, you brought up kind of where he resides. Typically, right? You know, we we talked about the fact that he's um, from Earth, um, from the Greyhawk realm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he the goes to Waterdeep, spe- right? Right, Gray Space. He goes to Waterdeep in the Far Space, um, specifically because people don't recognize him there. Typically, right. Like, he goes there to party with people because he's not from there and he doesn't want people to know who he is. He wants to party. <laughs> <laughs> it's like going to the club, but he gets to do it in a different multi or in a different universe, right. you know. And then you you also talked about the Tower of Urn. That is kind of one of the coolest things that he ever developed was this wizard's tower and again, he's a 27th level wizard, so he has a little bit more knowledge about how to build a tower that is exceptionally magical, right? Mm-hmm. And this particular one um, is capable of multiversal travel. It can travel across all dimensions, basically. And when it like goes to a certain realm, let's say Avernus, right? It has this like a base plate almost that it it pops into existence there and then locks into the base plate. It's like, and yeah. just locks into it. And, and essentially, that's where that's how his tower works wherever it goes. It pops out of existence and then pops into existence another place and then locks into this base. And so you can actually run across these bases, these tower bases, in the different areas of the multiverse, right. in, the, in the different planes, which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah. What would you, uh, Monty, how would you, as a DM, play Morden Kanan into your campaign? How would, how would you integrate him into your campaign? Hmm. Well, how I would play him is uh, sort of his personality, and that usually, you know, that's already basically written for us. It's his, you know, he's stoic. He's, you know, uh, seems to be frowning a lot. He's got that deep voice if you can try to you know practice speaking melodically um but if i was to sort of add him into a campaign i'd most likely do it as a, you know a quest giver right morton mm. kanan uh you know he's he's kind of just witnessing everything at this point as long as things stay in balance he's not interested in really sure. affecting change so uh, maybe he does have some change he wants to affect on like a small scale, and so he'll just uh, have some drags go out and do it for him, right? <laughs> or, or maybe he, you know, there's something he wants to collect, or he's too lazy to go get it. Now, the party wouldn't end up knowing that. I think that the way I would play it is I would, I would make it seem like he's really embellishing this story that he has for the players, right? <laughs> and that he, you know, oh yes, well, at the end of all of this, you will be granted all this great power and treasure, and uh, I only ask for a trinket in return. That that seems to be sort of like the baseline that you would go with for like his quest giving nature, unless there was something to do with like 
helping him recover from madness. You know, if you wanted to incorporate him in a way that uh, adds also his stories, right? Um, right. Like, for example, the Curse of Strahd campaign, Morden Kanan is literally suffering from madness and amnesia. So when you go to help him, it's he, he's a very, like, different person and NPC, and that's that's its own thing. But, yeah, I would most likely add him in as a quest giver. How would you do it? Well, I was thinking, you know, one of the things that I like to do in my campaigns is usually just have kind of a background character that that basically all they do is assist the players for whatever my whim is. <laughs> If that makes sense, it, it not so much as a quest giver, but as a like a patron. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. Somebody that that isn't typically giving them quests, but kind of pointing them in the direction of where the quest givers might be. Might be, you yeah. know. Uh, I did this with in my most recent campaign. I did this with great fairy style, like Zelda style great fairies. Mm-hmm. They were basically just like a matron for the party. They didn't really do anything. They were kind of just rooting them on, you know? Yeah. They would, every once in a while, just give them a little buff just to make them feel better about themselves, but really not actually doing anything legitimately helping them, just right. to make it seem like they were involved. That's kind of how I like to play those those characters that seem like they're outside of really the uh, turmoil of what's going on in the universe. You yeah, know what I mean? For sure. And Morton Kanan kind of is like that. He's that character where he, his, his ideal is not so much th- the worry about what's going on on Toril. Mm-hmm. It's more the worry about what's going on in the entirety of the multiverse. Right. And this tiny little section of the sword coast, you know, it's not that big of a deal to him. You yeah. know, but he might he might say, "Oh, you know, I, I take a liking to this particular character because he reminds me of me when I was a younger, when I was a younger wizard." You mm-hmm. know, he actually does that. He he does that in the lore uh, with Bigby. Yeah, Bigby was an evil wizard at one right. point, and uh, Morden Kanan put a charm spell on him, basically made him his slave until Bigby decided that he was going to change his ways. And then he released him from the charm spell, and guess what? Bigby became one of the Circle of Eight. He's one of uh, Morden Kanan's closest friends. Or and was. I thought that he, or was, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to get to that because that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, Morden Kanan, when he I, – I brought up earlier the Citadel of Eight mm-hmm. and then the Circle of Eight. Those are two different factions. Those are two different parties. The Citadel of Eight was eight characters that – Gary Gygax built all eight of these characters were all player characters of Gary's. And they died, <laughs> except for Morden Kanan, because of Vecna. And those of you that have seen Stranger Things, you probably have heard of Vecna. Um, Vecna is an actual D&D character, and he's the lich god. Well, he's not really a god. He tried for godhood in that campaign, and he didn't descend. Yeah, and uh, I, that if was you, his goal. You'll, you will see a lot of references to, to him being a deity, right? Right, and right. Eye of Vecna, just of just Vecna. like Morden Kanan is as close to deity as you right. can get, right? He right. essentially is. And you know what's interesting about Vecna is really that he's the anti Morden Kanan, really. I think I think that's a good point because both Morton Kanan and Vecna see the universe or the multiverse as requiring balance, and right. in, and uh, from what I understand, the reason Vecna went and destroyed the Council of Eight is there was there was in there was an imbalance. He doesn't have his own Citadel of Eight, right? Yeah, yeah and so exactly. he he needed to create the balance of right. the the balancing parties, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I I just I really like that I really like that whole uh, the reason for Morden Kanan's almost his drive to become a balancer in the in the multiverse was because uh, initially like all of his friends died mm-hmm. <laughs> and then and then he he gathers together all of these exceptionally powerful wizards Big B um, Odaluk and and the rest I can't remember them off the top of my head they're right here. 
Um, yeah, Big B, uh, Nystal, which is another one, Rary, Auto, Tensor. All of those wizards then become invested, right, in that neutral, everything's got to be balanced. And that means if their mother has to die for balance, they'll kill, a, they'll kill her themselves. <laughs> like, right. the, it's that sense of balance that has no morality whatsoever. It's like balance is the ultimate moral at that point. Right. I have a uh, quote here from Vecna that I really like. Help it helped me realize, you know, what how it is that his relationship with Morden Kanan is. And uh, it's evil is not an absence of good. It is not a choice. Evil is one of the two forces in the cosmos, an agency locked in eternal struggle against its antithesis. Only good and evil exist, and not even a hair's width of space separates them. That's 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 pretty profound. Yep, I, I thought that was I, absolutely great philosophy I coming think, from a fictional character. <laughs> I think what's interesting about it, I think what's interesting about it is actually how like opposite from reality that really is. Yeah, sure. Because because good evil really is the absence of good. Yeah. It's like Vecna and whoever was writing that uh, quote through Vecna. He was establishing what he believes is this eternal struggle between good and evil. Mm-hmm. When, when re- in reality, we've talked about it in, our, in, in the past where good and evil really aren't equals. No. Yep. Evil, is, evil is the enemy and evil will ultimately go by the wayside. Right. And that's like, yes, I, Morden Kanan fascinates me. Elminster is not a balancer. He's a good guy. Right. Right. And we'll, we'll eventually have to talk about him, too. You know, uh, to go back on your point okay. real quick, it's really important to have that distinction because the balancing people are the ones who believe that, that the two things on either side of the scale yeah. have equal value. Right and equal power, right and right to some degree, um, Morden Kanan is maintaining like a false reality in, right. in the D and D universe. If you want to add some real life uh, sort of philosophy to it, if you went and spoke with like Lothander, for example, you should hear something along the lines of this, and it's that that's just not true. Do you really believe that without evil in the world, that the world would be lesser for it yeah it doesn't mean that there isn't you know improvement or failure right failure is not an evil thing right Right. there's sort of this this mistaken idea that like doing something wrong um and i mean like morally wrong versus doing something incorrectly right yes and and incorrectly not in a moral wrong way that's an important addition to that is somehow taken away once you get rid of evil entirely. But that's just philosophically not true. They are separate, right. distinct things. And and that's and that's why Morden Kanan, though though extremely interesting. And, and influential even, and powerful. And and even com- and and powerful and compelling. Right. He really he really, really doesn't understand <laughs> From our what he's opinion. Doing. Like, yeah, he's, he's from our opinion, he he knows what he's doing. From his opinion, from my opinion, you know he's he's misled. Yep. Let's just put it that way. Yep. Um, but his his convictions are strong. I tell you that. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything else, Monty, that you'd want to add to our conversation about Morden Canaan tonight? Well, um, I guess the last thing I would say is just that if if you intend on fighting a fully realized Morden Canaan in your campaign for whatever reason, God forbid. Um, DMs, I want you to prepare spells that you've never thought of. Come up with something new. Because a 27th level wizard, first of all, is going to have an immense spell casting pool um, right. to draw from. But on top of that, he should be able to... Now, respecting Mistra is something that he does when it comes to the Far Realm. And so he doesn't necessarily go against the goddess of magic who refined the weave to be able to only allow mortal spellcasters to spell cast up to ninth level. Right. What, but we all know they're 10th level and beyond spells. 
Right. Morton Kanan should be considered a spellcaster at least capable of 10th level, if not higher, um, spellcasting. And if he can do that, he can reshape things in front of him and probably even uh, erase your party from existence. So Essentially, <laughs> essentially like Thanos using the power glove. That's exactly right. Exactly. Yes. Essentially like using the Infinity Stones and the Infinity Gauntlet to to do whatever he wants. I like how you he call it the, the power glove, like it's the glove yeah. from the Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, why did I say that? <laughs> the Infinity Gauntlet. Yes. I knew what I meant. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think one of the things that um, my discussion and my, you know, my excitement about Morden Kanan, it really, again, goes back to the fact that he was a player character. Mm-hmm. I've done that. I don't know if you've done that in, in, in any of your campaigns as a DM, um, but your story for your characters, just because the game's over, doesn't mean it has to be over. Right. Write a story. Yeah. I mean, if you've, if you've actually gone out there and you've created this compelling uh, character, make something out of it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we, we talked about that in our episode zero, Monty, how important storytelling really is yep. and how enjoyable it can be, right? If you've got a compelling character, my favorite uh, – so I've got – I have uh, specifically two characters that will be forever uh, reflections of me in in everything that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, one is Cypher Sky, who is a drow sorcerer, draconic bloodline, red draconic bloodline, uh, Monty – you know almost every single character that I've ever made in any video game or whatever has always been Cypher, right? That's right. And Sky, uh, uh, Cypher's actually a, uh, an allusion to Final Fantasy VIII, mm-hmm. and Sky is an allusion to Slifer the Sky Dragon from Yu-Gi-Oh! That's right. And I put them both together, and they, he has been my character from uh, fantasy all the way through, like, Star Wars games. So, yeah. I, And then I've got another character. His name is Yuvari, and he is an Arakokra. And he's a Hexblade, wiz- or Hexblade warlock, okay? These two characters mean a lot to me. I imagine, like, Morden Kanan did to Gary, yeah. right? Yeah. He spent... He spent 12 years before he was pushed out of TSR. uh, He spent 12 years of his life developing this character. He's got to mean something to him, right? Am I correct in saying that Gary Gygax is no longer with us? Oh, I I don't know for sure. (laughs) Um, I just know that he's not in in any D&D he is not related to him in any way anymore he's not in, he does not influence them at all anymore gosh it certainly looks like he's still nope he died in 2008 that's a bummer anyway so a very he was very influential for Gary right if you've got a character and Gary spent 12 years of his life using this character writing stories about this character if you've got a character in your life, in your game, that you think is compelling and actually has a great story, develop it. Yeah. Right? That's what these people out there that, do, that play these live, uh, live play podcasts, um, D&D sessions, mm-hmm. like Critical Role, uh, like High Rollers. Monty, do you know any other ones out there? Um, Dungeon Dance. <laughs> Sure, yeah, one. that's another good one. Uh, Dungeon Drunks is another one that I've heard. Um, all of these different uh, live play podcasts, they are developing a story mm-hmm. on a character. Yeah, um, and think about like with Critical Role, right? Critical Role has a show now. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what your point is with this is that those characters become a legacy – Yep, and exactly. you can share that legacy with other people, and the stories kids. that you write and uh, and experience together, you share that with people, and it's it's uh, it's an emboldening of that that character, the tradition, and right. uh, the sort of the representation that those things you know go along with. Whether it's for comedy, whether it's for you know, <laughs> it, it, honestly, it helps build relationships. It says a lot of good for uh, you know 
a lot of things. But if you want to, if you have any desire to get, you know, your character's name and, and, um, ideas and thoughts or whatever out there, um, you should certainly take it to the pen first because that's the, probably the easiest way to, um, you know, put your thoughts together and, and a right. story that, that you want to refine. Right. Yeah. And that's, but that's, that's my point is these characters can, and I, I know they get close, that we get close to our characters just like Gary did with, with, uh, Morden Kanan. Mm-hmm. And, and we, we want to see something of them. I'm encouraging you. This is like a call to action before our call to action. Go out there and write a story and then send it in to us. Tell us about it. I'd love to hear about your characters. Um, with that said, uh, that's the end of our podcast for tonight. I would like to thank you all for listening. Uh, we love you guys very much. You guys have any one of you out there that have listened to this, stuck it out with us, even for our only our third episode. Um, uh, you guys are amazing. You're rock stars. We've said that that in the past. And we want to continue to hear from you. Uh, Monty, go ahead and give the rest of our call to action. Yep. Don't forget to like and subscribe, guys, and uh, leave a comment. I will read them. I actually do promise that. Um, And don't forget to go out there and slay those dragons. That's right. You guys have a great night. Out. Morden Kanan. Morden Kanan, that's right. In Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes. I say Morden Kanan. A lot of people say Morden Kanan. Uh, Morden Kanan. Xanathar's or Tasha's. Uh, Morden Kanan presents. Back to Morden Kanan. Gary Gygax. That Morden Kanan. Gary Gygax and Rob Kuntz. Morden Kanan is Gary Gygax. Morden Kanan. Gary. Gary. Rob and Gary. Rob Kuntz and, and Gary Gygax. Uh, Morden Kanan. Morden Kanan. Morden Kanan to Morden Kanan. Gary Gygax. Aerthians. Air, Aerth. Earth, Earth, Earth. Morden Kanan is Earth. Gary, Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes. Morden Kanan, Count von Strahd. Zenik Yendar, Zenik, yep. and Morden Kanan, Zenik, or Zenk, Zenk Yendar. Morden Kanan Seal. Yeah. Morden Kanan. Bigby, Udaluk. Said Udaluk, Safina, Edgen, and Helga to Morden Kanan. Bigby's hand. Bigby's Maximilian's hands. Tensor right. is another one. I think it's Tensor's Mind Whip. Rarys, Elminster's. Ed Greenwood, Elminster, Omar, Morden Kanan, Dalamar, Dalamar, and Morden Kanan, Elminster, Ed Greenwood's house by Morden Kanan, uh, Von Strahd. Uh, it was Elminster. It was Elminster. Yeah, Morden Kanan, Strahd. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock movie. Yeah, Morden Kanan's Morden Kanan's Tower of Urn, Elminster. Ed Greenwood, Laurel Stil- Silverhand, Elminster. Morden Kanan just shows up. Morden Kanan, Dalamar, and. Elminster. Uh, Elminster, or not Morden Kanan, excuse me. Ed, Ed Greenwood. Greenwood. Ed of the Greenwood. Earth. Right, Morden mm. Kanan. Bigby. Gary Gygax. Vecna. About Vecna is really that he's the anti Morden Kanan. Both Morden Kanan and Vecna. Bigby. Um, Odaluk. Uh, Nystal. Rary. Otto. Tensor. Vecna. That Morden Kanan is. Through Vecna. Morden Kanan. Lothander. Conversation about Morden Kanan. Mistra is. Morden Kanan. Thanos. Cypher Sky. Slifer the Sky Dragon, Yuvari, Morden Kanan did to Gary. Gary Gygax, just like Gary did with, with uh, Morden Kanan.